the International Luxembourg Forum on Preventing Nuclear Catastrophe was founded in 2007 by the prominent European public figure Vyacheslav Kantor. In 1992, Francis Fukuyama, an American political scientist, political economist and author, stated that the unpleasant part of history had ended and that the world could relax. That, of course, was not the case. History does continue. And how? Every day brings chilling news. The world becomes fearful, but few realize it or do not want to see it. Decapitating terrorist groups has not killed them. Instead, they have metastasized. Al-Qaeda spawned several affiliates that may now be more dangerous than Al-Qaeda itself. On the supply side, there's long been concern that North Korea might sell nuclear wares to terrorist groups. After all, it helped Syria build a plutonium production reactor before Israeli jets destroyed it in 2007. And Gaddafi acquired North Korean uranium for his nuclear weapons program. North Korean officials have warned that they could sell nuclear material even to non-state actors. It's worrisome that North Korea continues to increase its holdings of nuclear material. They could conceivably conclude that they have more than enough for their own purposes, and thus some could be sold for profit. Given the relative simplicity of making gun-type bombs using highly enriched uranium, this material is potentially attractive to non-state actors, as you know. It's all the more important then that diplomatic engagement with North Korea succeeds in stopping production of nuclear material and agreeing on steps to eliminate existing stocks. There's also the prospect for nuclear terrorism in South Asia, as uh, Ambassador Lukin mentioned. The recent uh, uh, arrest of Julian Assange reminded me of the release nine years ago by WikiLeaks of US diplomatic cables that expressed concern that fissile material in Pakistan could fall into the hands of terrorists. A 2009 cable from the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad said, quote, Our major concern is not having an Islamic militant steal an entire weapon, but rather the chance someone working in government facilities could gradually smuggle enough material out to eventually make a, a weapon, unquote. The concern is based on Pakistan's growing stockpiles of fissile material, the number and brazenness of extremists in the country, and the creeping fundamentalism of the society. The more weapons and fissile material that is produced, the more potential there is for theft, seizure, or sabotage. To do this successfully, we must change the way we think about the risks of nuclear use. We have new risks and new problems, but old thinking. The burden of change starts with us. The risks are not in fact that one country is preparing a nuclear provocation against another. The risks lie in the fact that today there are too many non-state actors, many extremist organizations that have substantial potential and could trigger real problems that may subsequently involve nuclear powers. Considering that today sophisticated technology leaves little time for political decision making, this could happen at any time and quite suddenly. We know how world wars were provoked by relevant incidents and we know the result. In the context of the unavailability of a political control mechanism, a lack of trust and negotiation processes, such incidents might provoke developments that many states might not be prepared for. And that is where the real danger lies. We are the Luxembourg Forum on Preventing Nuclear Catastrophe, meaning that it is possible to prevent nuclear catastrophe, and therefore steps should be taken to do so. That is the goal of our forum and the conference. It's no accident that the older generation working in the Luxembourg Forum wants the next generation to have the fear, in the finest sense of the word, of nuclear catastrophe. For the younger generation, nuclear weapons aren't seen as a terrible danger, but as an efficient instrument. Grey-haired people like me should draw attention to it if the young people lack adequate understanding. Regrettably, we've become used to it. The vast majority of the world population has become used to it. Year after year, people have been told of the nuclear danger and that we all may die. And sooner or later, they stop listening. It will take some time for these apprehensions to reappear. This conference has brought together the most competent experts 
the heads of five major international organizations engaged in studying nuclear arms control issues, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs and others. And I have the impression that we're going through a crisis of absence of demand. No one is listening to such experts. John Bolton doesn't care a damn. He has already scored two points, first by destroying the ABM Treaty, and then by nearly destroying the INF Treaty. Now he wants a hat-trick to close a new START Treaty. And this is terrible. John Bolton is the United States National Security Advisor, known as a foreign policy hawk. Time doesn't permit a critique of the ban treaty here. Um, the ban treaty proponents say they intend the treaty to complement the NPT, but unfortunately the treaty's provisions on areas such as safeguards show a disconnect between what states have supported in previous NPT review conferences and what they've been prepared to accept in this treaty. Because the two treaties have members in common, the near universality of the NPT means the states supporting the ban treaty are all NPT parties. The implications for the NPT review conference are not clear. For a start, it's not certain whether the ban treaty will actually be in force by the time of the review conference. Regrettably, the emergence of a new treaty without the participation of the nuclear weapon states emphasises the divide between those with and without nuclear weapons. Will a ban treaty block form within the review conference? It is imperative that the ban treaty does in fact complement the NPT. It is incumbent on, NP on ban treaty supporters to do everything they can to avoid any adverse impact on the NPT. If the NPT is weakened, the entire international community will be the loser. It is essential to emphasize that non-proliferation and disarmament are inextricably linked. The NPT is often mistakenly referred to as a two-way bargain between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states. If we are going to extend the treaty, <coughs> We need to deal with two things. First, we need to deal with the concerns that Victor just mentioned about U.S. procedures for reducing the number of accountable launchers on ballistic missile submarines and U.S. procedures for demonstrating the non-nuclear status of bombers. We also need to agree not on what the procedures will be, but that there will be procedures to account for the novel Russian systems such as the intercontinental range torpedo and the nuclear-powered international cruise missile. Those need to be brought in to the New START regime. Now, these are not hard issues. They're time consuming, but technically you can see how to make solutions. I believe that because they are time consuming, we should commit to their resolution at the time of extension but we should not make completing that resolution a prerequisite for extension because I believe we will run out of time. Both sides should make it clear that the extension does not take away the ability to withdraw and if it becomes obvious that the other side is not meeting its obligations, then that would be something to consider. But we should not hold up the extension uh, until we have solved these issues, because they're, they're not conceptually hard, but they'll be difficult to deal with technically. Here we'll go on to the next stage, to the present day security philosophy in Moscow and Washington, and how it's built. This is not the problem of Mr. Bolton. 
whom we all know very well. Bolton was also under Mr. Bush Jr.'s administration. But we know that discussions about a U.S. withdrawal from the ABM treaty began under Clinton, not under Bush. They ended under Bush. Generally, the question is whether security philosophy is based on your own security facilities or if it requires collective mutual agreement and mutual trust measures. I think that we're entering an epoch where new mechanisms are needed, and we need a comprehensive discussion on how to reach an agreement on such mechanisms that would allow, even in the present-day context of quite intense political confrontation between the United States and Russia, to keep this strategic security area under control. The understanding that a nuclear war cannot be won has dissipated. World leaders don't say it today. Quite the opposite. They speak of nuclear arms modernization, which also affects public sentiment. Compared to the situation during the Cold War, the general public is very passive. People have become accustomed to thinking that because nuclear weapons were not used in the past, they will not be used in the future either. The danger lies in the fact that this forgetfulness, this disregard of the need to eliminate the risk of using nuclear weapons may in fact, under certain circumstances, lead to the unintended outbreak of nuclear war due to wrong decisions being made by leaders who do not fully appreciate the efforts of a decision to use nuclear weapons. Can we say that the arms race has already begun? It never ended. As long as armaments exist, they will be perfected. It's another matter that the arms control treaties help to curb the arms race. The arms race has always been and always will be. Perfecting weapons is an ongoing process that cannot be stopped, but it should be controlled. The arms control regime is an instrument for doing that, thus excluding an uncontrolled nuclear arms race. It's assumed that the main beneficiaries of the arms race are the military-industrial complex and arms manufacturers. Manufacturers produce weapons ordered by the military. If they have no such orders, they will not manufacture them. They are set a task. While new breakthroughs in technology allow the creation of more sophisticated weapons, it's an unavoidable process that cannot be stopped and should be controlled, so it doesn't get out of hand. It should therefore be limited, otherwise we may face a great disaster. The point at issue is not just political positions, but also public sentiment. No one wants to negotiate and meet halfway. When you study history, including modern history, you understand the vigorous efforts, joint efforts, as the agreements reached were not unilateral agreements, but bilateral and multilateral, that helped reach a certain stage in the development of relations and maybe see future prospects. And when such prospects unexpectedly become obscure and sometimes vain, then professionally, it gives rise to certain emotions. Diplomacy, though, cannot be based on emotion and feelings. We should realistically assess the situation and see what can be done in this situation. How to find a way out, as there are no dead-end situations. The main thing is to make a sober assessment and not to mistake a wish for reality. The most dangerous thing is a confrontation between the United States and Russia. Our countries have lost mutual trust that existed for several decades. When in doubt, questions were asked and answers were given within the permanent consultation process. But that process no longer exists. What is the state of relations between our two countries now? The lowest of the low, and largely due to the faults of both parties. In the case of the United States, it is endless sanctions, escalation of sanctions, the tough discourse of which we are all growing tired of. However, it should be said that the other side does not make clear statements on some issues, from Polonium and Novichok to the Boeing over Donbass, but mere declarations. For the first time ever, the new American budget has allocated so much money for military build-up and opposition to Russia. However, for each move by one party, there's a counter-move by the other. New types of arms are being developed involving autonomous systems and artificial intelligence. That's very dangerous because if artificial intelligence is combined with new types of weapon, humans might lose control. Do you think that the military fears using nuclear weapons? Or do they see them as just another means of destroying the enemy? The military that deals with nuclear weapons does understand their enormity. 
I have contacts in particular with our counterparts and they too deeply understand the problem and dread the risks that could lead to the actual use of nuclear weapons. As for the United States, those who deal with nuclear weapons in the US, they also understand the danger and, as far as I can see, fear the actual use of nuclear weapons. Moscow and Washington do not trust each other, with the blame game going on and on. The United States has accused Russia of violating the ban on nuclear testing. The US accusations have surprised me. Russia is a party to and ratified the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. The Americans have not ratified the treaty and are likely to try to give good grounds for refraining from ratification because Russia allegedly violated it. That's my conclusion. Actually, Russia has no need for such testing as she is not developing any new types of nuclear device, deploys already developed weapons and, moreover, has cut the list of nuclear devices. The academic Sagdeyev has lived in the United States for many years. Does the US establishment understand Russia? There are many smart people here, gurus, but holders of mandates for election to the Senate House or House of Representatives are not necessarily such gurus, but regrettably, they have the final say. And what about Russia's place in US politics? Today, Russia is mostly used in the interests of internal politics, the struggle between Republicans and Democrats. Russia is charged with interference in the elections and so on, but internationally I think that Russia's contribution to the world economy has become quite insignificant. And this is the governing factor that determines attitudes towards Russia. Even now, at this very tense moment in bilateral relations, there is no hate in respect of Russia among the American political establishment. Perhaps there is irritation, but I wouldn't call it hate. A certain part of our establishment feels serious dissatisfaction, strong irritation concerning many issues such as Ukraine, the Crimea of course, as well as the strange behavior of our president. All this gives rise to rejection. Naturally, the interference in the 2016 elections in the United States, although I for one do not consider it was a cardinal factor that determined the election outcome, but that's another matter. I see neither hate nor penetrative understanding. I'll tell you why. Despite this state of excitement, if not hysteria, though without hate, the United States is not as much interested in Russia as it was during the Cold War. Today, if I remember rightly, our bilateral trade is about 25 to 30 billion dollars. True, more Americans now go to Russia, but it's not that easy, as one has to obtain a visa and so on. Accordingly, it's now more difficult to get an American visa for Russians. But I think that's largely connected with a longer waiting time than with bureaucratic red tape. Generally speaking, the two countries are now swimming freely, as they say in Russia. Americans don't see Russia as a great power since, in the present day, the power of a country is determined by the efficiency of its economy, rather than its ability to destroy another state using nuclear weapons. But American political experts do keep talking about Russia. Judging by discussions and the Democratic Party's response to various statements made before the forthcoming meeting between Trump and Putin, the interest is considerable. But in terms of commerce and trade, business is business. There is no special interest. Most strikingly, and maybe unpleasantly, there is no Russian lobby in the United States. The situation is incomparable to US-China relations. Even now, at a very tense moment with very serious negotiations underway, not only on trade but on a much wider range of issues in US-China relations, the pro-Chinese lobby is much larger, much more influential because the stakes are specifically much higher. What is Russia to President Donald Trump? What place does Russia take in his intense reflections on the outside world? Perhaps he remembers the Miss Universe competition in Moscow, but all his good words addressed to Russia notwithstanding, he still signs all the sanctions. And what about missiles with nuclear warheads? Do Americans see Russia as a threat to themselves? Obviously, they see Russia as an existential danger, meaning that at any time, should something go wrong, Russia might destroy American civilization. But for some reason, this does not lead to the conclusion that the parties should sit down at the negotiating table and find a way out. Before Russia sent troops to Syria and essentially changed the course of the war there, Russia was not seriously perceived as a military power due to the very strong intellectual heritage of the 1990s. Now she is perceived much more seriously. 
Militarily, if we factor out nuclear weapons, these are not everyday threats, but they are seen as something more serious. In addition, we have allied obligations to our European allies who are also important to us. But I would say there's no such perception as existed during the Cold War. If the politicians dislike each other so much, then the militaries must also hate each other. No, that's not so, but regrettably, contact between the military sides, as far as the United States and Russia are concerned, has stopped. There is occasional contact at the top level only between ministers, chiefs of staff and US Joint Chiefs of Staff, but not on the general agenda of preserving strategic stability. But as a rule, in respect of urgent issues such as the avoidance of direct clashes in Syria and so on, this is not the level of negotiations that could help maintain strategic stability. I visit Moscow once or twice a year and perhaps it's a kind of self-selection, but I don't feel tension or hate in respect of the United States. There are questions, quite a number of them of our policy, and many of them are just questions, as was discussed at the previous panel. There is no denying that, but I do not feel widespread hate. Moreover, if earlier we talked of hate towards the West, now you will see it for yourselves. I came to Rome yesterday and walked through it and heard a lot of Russian voices. I remember my first arrival in Rome, in 1978, when my family and I emigrated. There were no Rome guides in Russian then. Now there are lots of them. The influence of the Luxembourg Forum is based on the high level of its analytic consideration. The Forum brings together the most reputable foreign and military policy experts from various countries. Outstanding scientists attended the conference, along with diplomats, political figures, and military experts who previously held high-ranking posts as foreign affairs and defense ministers. Now and then, a question is asked about whether relations between our countries have reached the bottom. I'm sure that both Moscow and Washington understand full well that if that were so, the consequences for our two countries and the world generally would be disastrous. Both countries demonstrated such an understanding during the Cold War years and hopefully will likewise demonstrate it now. This, however, is not a cause for appeasement. The great Notre Dame de Paris, a unique monument that had been visited by people from all over the world for centuries, was enveloped by flames in a matter of minutes, quite unexpectedly. No one believed it, but nevertheless it happened. The present-day world looks even more unprotected and vulnerable in terms of security than the Notre Dame in Paris. From my point of view, Russia and the United States still have, and quite reasonably, a special responsibility for ensuring international security. First, Russia and the United States are still the only world powers capable of destroying each other multiple times, and the rest of mankind. Therefore, nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation and the prevention of nuclear terrorism are first and foremost the responsibility of our two countries. Yesterday we heard the opinion that this subject may be discussed in various formats involving other states. I do believe that unless and until dialogue between Russia and the United States on these issues is resumed, any talk about other formats is unpromising. Second, Moscow and Washington, for a variety of historical, geographical, economic and other reasons, are virtually bound to be involved in the most acute modern problems. Suffice to mention the Middle East, Afghanistan and the Korean Peninsula. The global instability curve runs through the zones of vital interest for our two countries. This is vividly illustrated by the Middle East. Never before have the armed forces of Russia and the United States been in direct contact, as they are in Syria now. This is a new reality, and regrettably, it could occur elsewhere too. This morning, a Russian interceptor dangerously approached an American reconnaissance plane in the Mediterranean. This shows that we are now within that instability curve. Third, our countries are in the epicenter of many global problems from energy and ecology to cyberspace and space. Without mutual understanding and cooperation between our two countries, any progress in these areas will be extremely difficult. Who could expect that the United States would pay such attention to the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline project, an economic project for all the countries directly interested in its construction? However, we see active effort by Washington against it. This is a global competition in the energy sector and we can name the areas too. Today it's very important to answer one question to oneself and to each other, one that is very important from my point of view. Are Russia and the United States uncompromising opponents in the present-day world, or can they still be partners despite all the disagreements?
This is not a simple question because we understand full well that our policies will depend on the answer to it. At the turns of the 20th and 21st centuries, Russia and the United States, Russia and NATO stated that they were partners and would jointly counter global challenges. I remember signing an instrument with NATO in 1997 and the establishment of the Russian NATO Council in 2002. If you look through the relevant documents, you will see that they state that our countries do not pose a threat to each other. A comprehensive report was delivered by William Perry, who was US Secretary of Defense from 1994 to 1997. From 1969 to 2016, almost 50 years, every administration in Washington or Moscow sought to limit the cost and danger of the nuclear arms race through bilateral treaties. In the US, both parties considered that normal and wise. For the Trump administration, the new normal is to not negotiate any new treaties and systematically withdraw from the treaties that existed when they took office. The most significant action has been their decision to withdraw from the INF Treaty. It's noteworthy that the prime mover behind this withdrawal has been John Bolton, who was also the prime mover behind the US withdrawal from the ABM Treaty almost 20 years ago. And it appears that the Trump administration intends to let New START expire in 2020 rather than extend it or negotiate a follow-on treaty. If that happens, there will be, for the first time in almost 50 years, no agreed limit on nuclear weapons. And there will be no bilateral talks underway on how to limit nuclear dangers. This has become the new normal for arms control treaties, which I call the new abnormal. The new abnormal is not to have a regular dialogue to deal with geopolitical disagreements. To put this in perspective, by the time I had been Defense Secretary for two years, I had met with the Defense Minister of Russia five times, and during those meetings we had reached agreements on matters of great significance. An important byproduct of this dialogue is that we reached a level of understanding and trust, so that if any new security issues arose, we could discuss them one-to-one -to, -one to resolve them before they got out of hand. But that normal way of dealing with security issues has been replaced with a new abnormal that does not include these important bilateral meetings at ministerial or sub-ministerial levels. And yet, strangely to me, there is almost no attention to the fact that this dialogue is not happening. The time for opening the Russia-US talks on extending the new START treaty is getting short. Therefore, it is entirely possible that the two parties will never agree to extend the new start and the existing nuclear arms control regime will finally collapse. The collapse of the nuclear arms control regime created by the efforts of the previous generations of sensible leaders of the United States and the USSR and from 1993 Russia will generate the 101 odd chances of an uncontrolled nuclear arms race. I think that it does not accord with the interests of either the United States or Russia. What could be done to minimize the effect of the termination of the New START? I think that Russia and the United States could make joint or parallel statements to the effect that, in the event of the termination of the treaty, they do not plan to build up strategic offensive arms in excess of the limits specified in the New START treaty. In this context, it would make sense if Russia and the United States continued to exchange information on strategic offensive arms, in the form of a political arrangement or otherwise, through nuclear risk reduction centers. The agreement for the establishment of such centers was signed in 1987, and states in particular, I quote, the centers may be used for the transmission by either party at their sole discretion of other communications as a display of goodwill and with a view to building confidence." Unquote. That is, in addition to those provided for by this and other agreements and treaties, this provision enables administrations in Russia and the United States to maintain legal compliance upon data sharing in the absence of the new start. The parties may verify the data received, even if not in full, as provided for by new start, using national technical control facilities. However, Periodic on-site inspections could become a significant confidence-building measure, with their procedure and number per year to be further discussed and agreed upon. The president of the forum, Vyacheslav Kantor, outlined possible steps to be taken. Speaking about the general situation, a well-known Russian intellectual said that we are standing on a traveling staircase, relentlessly moving downwards. Not to reach the very bottom, one must continually run upwards, even if not to reach the top. 
then at least to stay where you are. Luxembourg Forum analysts incessantly seek opportunities to advance upward as far as possible. What steps are possible here? President Trump has proposed replacing the INF Treaty with a new multilateral agreement. This was something President Putin had spoken about on a number of earlier occasions. Leaders receive such proposals from advisors with little understanding of the content of these kinds of treaties, and especially of the detailed verification systems which would be practically impossible to implement in a multilateral format. Furthermore, expecting that China or other nuclear states would agree to give up their intermediate range missiles is completely unrealistic. But ignorance can sometimes be put to good use, because these kinds of talks can last for years, and historical experience shows that the parties respect the planned limitations so long as the talks continue. I think that a multilateral format of nuclear arms control, even within the five nuclear powers, is a matter of the far future as no necessary military and political conditions have been created yet, which is evidenced by a statement made by the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Geng Shuang at a press conference briefing on the 6th of May 2019. He said that China would not participate in any negotiation for a trilateral China-US-Russia nuclear disarmament agreement. Therefore, the top priority, urgent task is to preserve the new start and then to discuss any next steps. Should it prove impossible to preserve the new start, Russia and the United States must take steps aimed to implement measures to minimize the relevant effects thereof. Some of them I've already mentioned in my speech. It will be anything but simple to bring them to life. It will require a strong political will of the leaders of Russia and the United States. But attempts can and must be made, as inaction is fraught with unpredictable negative consequences not only for Russia and the United States, but also for mankind generally. New START is viable, as both parties by an agreed date, the 5th of February 2018, had reduced their strategic offensive arms to a level that didn't exceed the limits established by the treaty, and therefore strictly complied with the limit established by New START. All technical issues relating to nuclear delivery vehicle conversion procedures can be settled by experts within the Bilateral Advisory Commission that was established under START. In my opinion, their settlement should not be made a condition for starting negotiations on extending New START. As we understand it, talks are underway on extending the New START treaty for another five years, noted Vyacheslav Kantor. We are cautiously optimistic for a positive outcome. The United States would benefit in terms of continuing to have exhaustive information on Russia's strategic offensive weapons, and Russia would benefit in terms of maintaining the strategic offensive weapons balance with the US and saving money. If the treaty is extended, we can hope that within five years an agreement will be reached on preserving the principles of strategic stability, and that this will result in the drafting of a follow-up START treaty. If that's true, if a follow-up treaty is drafted, President Trump would like to include China as well, but this looks highly improbable. It would make sense to focus on drafting a new treaty between the US and Russia first, and only then examine the possibility of involving China in one way or another. China is now getting close to the point where they say, as they have repeatedly said recently, are starting to seriously consider their global responsibility. They have accumulated the necessary resources due to their fantastic and unique development in the last 35 to 40 years, and indeed demonstrated how a country can be changed during one or one and a half generations. And now they have the resources, not the finger behind the back, but actual resources to think about their global responsibility and global role, including, without limitation, participation in dialogue on global stability. Is it possible to transform bilateral military agreements between the United States and Russia into trilateral arrangements involving China? In Russia, it's common practice to involve threes. Actually, I wrote a doctoral thesis on triangles, and I should say that the Chinese, who were the weak side of the triangle in the 1960s and 70s, coped admirably with a difficult situation. As a matter of fact, the key to a triangle is very simple. A situation where the weaker opponent has better relations with either of the other two opponents than they have with each other. The Chinese have succeeded in that. There were ups and downs, but generally they managed. Now it's not the Chinese who are the weak side. I don't know who, but not the Chinese. 
I think that this key still works, or it would work if it were inserted in the right lock. Participants at the International Luxembourg Forum Conference in Rome met with the Vatican Secretary of State, His Eminence Cardinal Pietro Parolin, as part of the dialogue and joint initiatives between the Luxembourg Forum and the Holy See. I think that we managed to establish confidential and regular relations with the Vatican. This is not our first meeting with the Vatican, and we've met with the Pope and with Cardinal Parolin, and today I think that these meetings have been further successfully developed. At any rate, the task of the Luxembourg Forum audience accumulation could be accomplished with the help of this instrument. At the same time, I would like to emphasize that, politically, nearly one billion people on our planet are Catholic, and the vertical integration of the Catholic Church management to a large extent may contribute to making this channel which we are now developing, an efficient instrument for promoting our ideas. The Forum's prestige is growing. The Luxembourg Forum Conference in Rome brought together the heads of five major international organizations engaged in studying nuclear arms control issues, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs, the Global Zero Initiative, the Russian International Affairs Council, and the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. The First World War, the Russian Revolution and other developments that followed, as well as the Second World War, were all based on many objective factors, but also, in no small degree, on atrophy of understanding of the enormous danger of war, both for existing and future generations. We should be wary of this danger, and I think the actual propaganda, if government propaganda can be useful at all, should be built around this idea perception of the necessity of what Alexander Solzhenitsyn called the saving of people. We have learned to pronounce this phrase, but failed to learn to save people. To save primarily means to save from mass destruction. This is a natural process that can be explained by mass psychology. Low tide and high tide. A new high tide should be organized, but how to do that is outside the competence of the experts assembled here. I believe it's wrong to say that all lessons of the past remained unlearned and unpunished, and our conference is eloquent evidence of this. Yes, indeed, there are a good many people aged more than 60, me for one among the participants, yet there are younger people too, university and postgraduate students who study these problems. True, not so many as in the time of the Cold War. We should not forget that after all the situation is not as bad as it was during the Cold War although it is still quite strained. We are learning step by step, and I think that the examples from history when mankind either came close to the edge or crossed the edge as in 1945 are so strongly engraved in our collective memory that it would be wrong to say that the lessons were unlearned and unpunished. There can be no solutions by force. They are an illusion. Take the First World War, a typical solution by force. Germany was stripped. Rhineland was taken, Germany was prohibited from having an army in excess of a meager level. And what was the result? The wounded, humiliated national feeling of a great nation. Unfortunately, it has found expression in flagrant, monstrous political forms. The Second World War was also followed by all sorts of things. Regrettably, our problems at the turn of the century, our third revolution for all its merits, has also led for a variety of reasons to a serious upsurge of wounded national pride. That must be overcome, but it can be done in different ways. You can embrace it and try to swim with the tide, or you can rise and stand against it, although it is very difficult to stand against a torrent. Or you can demonstrate finesse, intelligence and common sense, and find a balance between patriotism and the need for long-term global solutions relating to quite different issues. For years, I have been an open and reliable supporter of Igor Ivanov and his appeals to prevent nuclear catastrophe, not because I like what he says, but because I am convinced that when he held the highest posts in the Russian Federation, he put all these principles into practice. At the time, relations between Russia and the United States, which have the same lasting value now too, were better and at a higher level. The idea that's especially close to my heart is that we have forgotten how to negotiate in principle. We are not prepared to hear each other. I mean, Russia and the United States. We don't understand that to say no to each other is a deconstructive position. I consider, and this is another of Igor Ivanov's ideas, 
that we might try to use the Vatican's procedure for electing a pope. Keep the representatives of both parties confined in a room until the white smoke appears, and make them negotiate on and on, and keep talking and exchanging views. In the time of the Cold War, such was indeed the case. Soviet and US delegations stayed in Geneva for months when they negotiated the first treaties and arms control agreements. It was no picnic in those years, and the delegations worked on an ongoing basis. I remember full well how the delegations left, received new instructions, and came back a month later. They stayed there on a permanent basis. That is the right approach to the matter. Negotiations, especially in the current context with new technology, not just nuclear weapons, but the next step in technological development, what else will the human race invent to kill each other? These are the questions of today. Tomorrow there will be artificial intelligence and its involvement in our life along with cyber threats and so on. These things are certain. There is an urgent need for scientists, the military, politicians, interdisciplinary delegations to work on these problems on a permanent basis. Only then will we be able to understand the real threat from the other party. We will understand the trend of military, political and technological thought. This is beyond question in terms of approach. Today, all contacts that existed before have been broken. We all know that quite recently we had summit meetings within the Russian NATO Council, meeting at the highest level, meetings of defense ministers, foreign affairs ministers, chiefs of general staff, that is, we had a mechanism for discussing military issues. We held two annual Russia-EU summits every six months, meeting at ministerial and committee levels, that is, a huge mechanism of consultation, making it possible to search for solutions. Today, everything has been destroyed. What's to be done? From my point of view, the first thing to do, if we're talking about relations between the United States and Russia, leaving aside the European agenda, though that may also be covered by relevant arrangements, we should first of all draw up a list of the issues that, from the US perspective, constitute the biggest threat to US security, including several items, and a similar list for Russia. I'm sure that if we do that at a high professional level, we will find that we have many common threats, and we should sit down at the negotiating table and decide how to resolve these common problems, such as trans-border terrorism, movement of nuclear materials and so on. This would help pave the way for official talks. Today, the problem at the official level is that each party wants to save face and is afraid to make the first move so as not to be accused, God forbid, of showing a lack of determination. We have this possibility. The kissinger primakov Commission established in the early 2000s included former secretaries of state, former ministers and so on. It tackled these issues and quite efficiently. Today we might follow that line. The general public never got to know why President Putin decided to replace the Minister of Foreign Affairs and offered Igor Ivanov the role of Secretary of the Security Council. Igor Ivanov had aptly and carefully mended partnership relations with key Western countries. When he headed Russian diplomacy, the country had good relations with the outside world and could develop safely. Don't you ever give in to despair? So much has been achieved and now everything is falling apart before your very eyes. Or does a diplomat have to be an optimist? In the first place, it's a matter of professionalism. I understand the question. Even though political instructions may be given, a diplomat, for some reason or another, cannot implement them efficiently. It's a matter of diplomats' professional qualification. The skills of diplomats in the area of arms control are developed in the process of their work. It's like a surgeon. The more operations he does, the stronger his hand. In any profession, practice and experience play a key role. Who is the most difficult partner to reach an agreement with? Diplomacy is not born anew with each new minister. It has its history, its culture and its traditions. Incredible as it may seem, despite revolutions and other cardinal changes, our country too has certain traditions. It's very important that these traditions continue. Unfortunately, in some periods, for one reason or another, many diplomats were out of work, which naturally had a negative effect. But later, such good traditions were restored thanks to determined effort. Russian diplomacy has always been very efficient and competent, as was recognized by our counterparts. Other countries have their own schools. 
It was a revelation for me when I negotiated with the Iranians that Iran had a very interesting, highly professional and penetrative school of diplomacy. Understandably, considering their traditions, despite such cardinal political changes, the high standard of diplomat was maintained. That can be said of many countries. Your colleague, the Soviet Union's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Alexander Besmertnik, said that the Americans were very tough negotiators, and few knew how to deal with them. During negotiations, any diplomat must first and rightly understand his own position, what he wants to achieve, and second, understand the counterpart, how to implement the task set for him. Naturally, this concerns Americans, but also any other partner in the course of negotiations. The United States is sometimes a more difficult partner due to many factors. Their diplomacy may be sort of straightforward in terms of question formulation and attempts to gain their end. But nevertheless, as a rule, we succeed in striking a compromise in the course of negotiations. But how do you reach an agreement in such difficult situations? A negotiator, is that a special field of expertise in diplomacy? Naturally, there are relevant experts in diplomacy on country-specific issues and problems, and surely to negotiate on arms control issues, one should know not only the figures but also the substance of the matter, because a treaty stipulating particular arrangement formats also contains a great deal of mechanisms related to control and verification, and understanding such mechanisms is a specialism. Therefore, ministries of foreign affairs, both Russian and American, and in some other states, have special divisions of specialist dealing only with this problem. The trouble is that when negotiations have not been conducted for decades, as is the case today in relations between Russia and the United States, it naturally affects the quality of the specialists, because specialists without negotiations is quite an unusual occurrence. Negotiations are required, as well as understanding of the inner substance which cannot be read about in textbooks or orally described. You have to live in it, to know all the ins and outs, to understand how agreements can be reached. It seems quite easy, but as a matter of fact, it's a very complicated process and, as you know, basic arms control treaties were negotiated for years on end, with enormous effort. Does that mean the diplomats failed in their job? Any treaty or agreement is a political decision. Diplomats implement the instructions given by political leaders. They may contribute suggestions for consideration, but again, the final decision, both at the initial and the closing stage of any such negotiation on arms control, is made at the political level. You rightly said that there are no insoluble problems. This is true not only in respect of arms limitation or arms control, but also of many other problems, including regional, border problems, etc. Therefore, it is first political will, and then the tools which naturally include, in addition to diplomats, many other professions, military and other experts. But this is the second stage. It's an important stage as the results of negotiation depend on the professional skills of the negotiators, but without a clear political goal. That is why I said that any negotiator begins with the understanding of his own position and the mandate of the other party, and then tries to reach relevant compromises. The first thing is the political decision of your country, your mandate. If your mandate is clear and provides for agreements, and you see that the other party also mandates such agreements, they are reached. Are your efforts not in vain? What steps can be taken? Yes, I think yes. We are, in any case, have to do our maximum efforts to stop uh, the uh, possibility, appearance of the possibility of the Third World War. And uh, I see the, some ways how to do it, in spite of the very negative tendencies which are existing in Europe and in the world in general. And um, to make some logical jumps, to, to make our discussion shorter, I would say that the way is uh, uh, similar how to avoid economical, uh, political and electoral egos. Uh, in this case, we have to address the efforts of uh, organization like our organization, Luxembourg Forum, directly to, to young generation, mm -hmm. directly to wide auditorium, and speaking with them on their language. First of all, 
You know, I want to support strongly the initiative of Bill Perry. Bill Perry, a couple of years ago, started to produce short movies about the danger of nuclear proliferation, about the danger of local nuclear conflicts, about the danger of nuclear terrorism, which all, in reality, turns to be global conflict, global war and destruction of civilization in general. They had, according to my understanding, not more than 20, 25 thousand visitors. It's nothing. But idea is very, very global and on demand. If we can change the format of this presentation of uh, something which we don't like to imagine, but we can force to imagine through using the social media and um, Instagram as an example, best example. And we see a lot of positive examples uh, in the practice, on practice. So, today we decided that uh, we'll um, organize the youth section of Luxembourg Forum and delegate this uh, young generation of the experts the function to make some provocative, so-called sexy product, maybe sometimes uh, terrifying the imagination, but making everybody interested, millions and maybe hundreds of millions of people, what means the real nuclear war and how it, it could destroy the whole civilization in general. We gene genetically, we don't like this, but we have to, we are obliged to see the practical future that we could have if today we do not stop the war. This, first of all, should take and cover the wider auditorium and then politicians will follow because of their egos. They, they would not, it would not be possible to ignore these things. This is how I see the development of the situation. In other words, you're an incurable optimist. No, no. I am Virgo by sign. Virgos usually do not like any risks. By 24 hours 7 calculation about risks, they take them over and then they become very, very practical. Too many conflicts flare up because too many people are unable to understand the present-day world in its full complexity. That causes disappointment, and the outcome is obvious. It's not reason that triumphs and sets the tone, but resentment, irritation and anger. Instinct, too. This manifests itself in violence against things that people cannot and don't want to understand, just as it was in the 1930s.